Okay, okay, so let's start talking about um, uh, this study a little bit. It would have been so cool if you would have slammed the door. I would have loved that. Um, uh, yeah, stupid study, right? Okay, uh, this is on YouTube. Let's be serious. Okay, uh, like the effects of low carbohydrate diets and low fat diets. What did you all think of the paper, first off? It was interesting, right? Okay, so whenever we look at these papers, there's a few particular things that I want you to look at, and I think this paper exemplifies it really well. Um, you have to look at like where these papers are coming out of. So did anybody like notice that or look at that? I mean, you might be able to tell by these names, which are, you know, pretty much incomprehensible. Um, uh, but it's out of like Oslo, Norway. So Norway, whenever we think about diet, do we think that where someone is might have an impact on like what type of diet they might respond to a little bit better? So for example, for example, Norwegians, what is there to eat in Norway? Other than like shark and fish and like uh, butter, dairy, all of these types of things. So bread yeah yeah well like but like throughout a lot of the year they can't grow grain so like we we might think that like the further north someone goes uh is that latitude or longitude i think it's latitude i'm not sure i like i yeah lunch oh okay cool thank you thank you i did not do well in geography um that the further north they go the less access to carbohydrates that they might have like, does, any, does that make sense to anybody, right? So like in the Caribbean, there's more carbohydrates and things. So right there, they might be biased in a particular way. So yeah, it, um, uh, like I think that's somewhat interesting. Uh, so here, like I'm just going to read this to you really fast if you didn't read it so that we can get in with uh, the abstract. And let's think about how many questions that just the abstract answered right here. Um, you don't have to put on glasses, but if you want, I'm like that's cool. Yeah, so, sorry, did not mean to single you out. Um, effects of low carbohydrate diet uh, on body weight and cardiovascular risks are unclear. And previous studies have found varying results um, our study was to conduct a meta-analysis of randomized control trials assessing the effects of a low-carbohydrate diet versus a low-fat diet on weight loss and, cardio and risks of cardiovascular disease. Studies were identified by searching Medline, Embase, and Cochrane trials. Uh, studies had to fulfill the following criteria, so these criteria. It has to meet these, otherwise thrown right out. So it, the low carbohydrate diet had to be uh, defined in accordance with the Atkins diet or a carbohydrate intake that is below 20% of total energy intake. So a small amount, so like less than a fifth of whatever they're consuming energy-wise is coming from carbohydrates. Um, 20 subjects or more per group, um, uh, were, and they had to be previously healthy. So they had a BMI cutoff of if they were over 35, couldn't do it couldn't be in the study. And uh, the dietary intervention had a duration of six months or longer. Results from individual studies were pooled, uh, and they used a weighted mean difference, which we're going to look at the forest plots here in a bit, using a random effect model. And I, like, I'm not going to talk about the stats there, because it's, it's kind of complicated, and uh, I'm not even sure I understand it. Um, in all, 11 randomized control trials with uh, 1,369 participants met all the set eligibility criteria compared participants on a low-fat diet, uh, participants on low-carbohydrate diets experienced greater reduction in body weight. So over the course of like six months, at least, if not longer, that's about two kilograms. So that's around, you know, five pounds or so, right? So magnitude of the effect, keep that in mind whenever we're talking about this. Um, uh, so right there, uh, circulating triglycerides, um, uh, also had a greater increase in HDL or so-called good cholesterol um, and the LDL cholesterol uh, like seemed to go down more in the uh, uh, the other group. This meta-analysis demonstrates opposite changes in two important risk fact, uh, cardiovascular risk factors on low carbohydrate diets and weight loss and increased LDL cholesterol. Our findings suggest that the beneficial changes of low carbohydrate diets must be weighed against possible detrimental effects of increased LDL cholesterol. So overall, there's like over a thousand people in this study, right? So that's, that's kind of cool. And more or less good things are happening. So low carbohydrate is winning, except for on this cholesterol piece. So this, uh, this like LDL or so-called bad cholesterol, but the good cholesterol is going up more as well. More on that momentarily. Um, 
So uh, the purpose of this study, right here, this, this is more or less what it was. So in the present meta-analysis, they aimed to compare a typical low-carbohydrate diet defined as carbohydrate intake of 20 to 30 grams in the first phase or below 20% of total energy uh, with traditional low-fat diets compared with below 30 energy uh, uh, percent energy fat as uh, limited energy content, as well as determine the effects on long-term weight loss and several cardiovascular risk, um, uh, risk factors in healthy adults by examining relevant randomized control trials. So right here, these numbers. So below 20 or 30 grams, right? That's a very small amount, right? Like that type of low carbohydrate diet, you have to count vegetables. Like you can't eat too much broccoli to stay below that amount. Does anybody in here think that broccoli is unhealthy? Now it might taste bad, right? But like it's, uh, it's likely healthy, right? I mean like it might give you gas, but whatever, just eat more of it and get used to it. Um, uh, but like 20, 30 grams, that's a fairly low amount. This below 20% if you eat a like 2000 like calorie diet what's 19% of your energy coming from carbohydrates what is that in grams can anyone tell me can anyone tell me okay so like the the math to figure this out so like i don't know uh like someone do this someone do this if anybody has like times 0.19 can anyone tell me what that is? 380. 380. Right? So that's the amount of calories. If we divide that by four, what is it? 95. So that's how many grams of carbohydrates is on effectively the high end of this. Does anybody think that like doubling the amount of like or tripling the amount of carbohydrates on like one end or another might have an effect on how the data shakes out. Maybe, maybe. It might not, but like that's just something to keep in mind. So whenever they say here, like carbohydrate intake of 20 to 30 grams at one point and below like 20% at another point, that's actually a fairly large range. So they could be going from eating 10 grams to almost 100, right? <coughs> Right, so, so you see how like there's issues in this study already. Is everyone good with this or no? No. Thank you, Ari. Cool. All right. Cool. Moving on. So finding the studies. Whenever a person conducts a like meta-analysis and like systematic review, they have to like talk about how they actually even like found these. So uh, they had like. What is it? The protocol for this meta-analysis was actually registered with a governmental body. So you'll see that happen quite a bit. The reason for that is so that people can't go back and like change what their st statistical analysis might have been. Uh, uh, we'll get into ideas of like p-hacking or like trying to just find random associations with like large data sets like this but effectively that's what that's trying to prevent against now this like study selection I already uh, like labeled out all of those like six things uh, or is it uh, five things or so I'm sorry that they had to meet so I'm not going to read these to you but like randomized control trial uh, defined as like being somewhat Atkins like um, uh, they had to be healthy at least 20 subjects uh, like and six months or longer. So numerous things like that. Pretty, pretty good stuff so far. How are we feeling about this study at this moment? Pretty good? Pretty good? And uh, like down here, uh, this is just an explanation of uh, kind of what statistics that they were doing. I don't think that that's abundantly important for us to know, but like a weighted mean difference is just, it's really common in uh, the realm of like meta-analyses. So I want you to like have at least seen that before. Uh, like if you're ever reading one again. Now here, just to get uh, like a sense of what's going on, I, I, I don't know, like I think this is amazing. Whenever they were trying to find, like on Medline, all of these different websites to find like all of the papers that they possibly could that compared to low carb and low fat and things, they had 740 papers that they found. Like in this class, how many papers have I had you read? Like five? 
Can you imagine reading 700 of them? Right? Now, great thing about this, there's only 362 uh, left after they remove duplicates. So even there, 362 papers. To do good science, you have to read that many. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I should, I should have kept a tally mark of how many papers I've read, um, which, uh, I don't know, at least a dozen, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, jokes. Man, all right, okay. You know, I've been in a good mood most of today, right? Now, tanking. All right, cool. Uh, so, like, uh, 320 or so, and they excluded so many for various reasons, and they give reasons why. Um, studies performed on non-healthy people with diabetes, there's 12. Not a low-carb or low-fat diet, there's 29 there. Studies performed on subjects that were under 18 years of age, two of them, right? I mean, that, like, that's crazy. It's like, hey, let's... Uh, um, no carbs for children, I guess. Which, uh, actually, there's some research that m that might be a good thing in some cases. But, you know, like, I'm not going to talk about that here. So, 42 records retrieved to full text. And then, 31 records were excluded after full text review because of not satisfying the ex uh, inclusion criteria. Right? So, they went from 42 down to here at the very end of it, 11 studies. Like... Is this crazy to anybody? They started at like 740, and then they ended with 11, right? Now, do you think 11 studies are going to tell us everything we need to know about our diets? Probably not. Now, do you think 740 would? It might get a lot closer, right? I mean, like it's, uh, but like just 11, there can be a lot of bias in 11 studies. Um, so here... A lot of times, whenever you're writing a paper or you're interested in a lot of things, these meta-analyses or systematic reviews are really wonderful because they do cool stuff like this. So, like, these are the 11 studies in alphabetical order. So it effectively tells you all of the relevant information that you need to know about this. Like, okay, like, what constituted the low-carb diet? What constituted the low-fat diet? What country was it from? How long was it? Um, what was the dropout rate? You know, like, uh, that's some kind of interesting stuff right there. Now, just because, like, I've, I've read all of these studies, and uh, so, oh, okay, like, 11 that I've read, at least, not 700. Um, this Gardner one, uh, two, uh, 2007, that, that's out of Stanford University, like, a guy named Chris Gardner. It's actually a really uh, interesting study. So this right here, carbohydrate intake of 20 grams or less in the induction phase, two to three months, and under 50 grams or less on subsequent, like, ongoing weight loss phases. Now, if you actually pull that paper and see how many carbohydrates that they're consuming, all of them in the low-carb diet were actually consuming more like 100 to 120. Now, kind of what we talked about with like meat intake and mortality, you would only know that if you actually went and got that paper and read it, right? Right? Now, like here, this, now it's probably because Norwegians don't know English very well and that they didn't like read the, I'm, oh, that was supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to be a joke. It's supposed to be a joke. It's uh, Norwegians actually like all the ones I've met know English very well. Um, uh, but like here, that is misleading. So if they're wrong right there, if that's misleading, what do we think about the rest of these? Like if I just told you that that's wrong. No, 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 no. Like it's uh, like they could have missed some things, but like it still might get us in the ballpark. So, so like from this study, we have to like kind of temper our recommendations. So you might think from the study, it's like, oh yeah, carbs are stupid and evil and all that type of stuff. I'm just pointing out that like, maybe that's not the whole idea of it. That like in Christopher Gardner's study, they did restrict carbohydrates quite a bit, but not nearly to the degree that it's saying right there. They were told to, but they didn't. Because, well, like, I mean, all of us like ice cream, right? Right, and that's really high in carbs. So uh, moving on from there. So the findings, let's, let's look at these. Um, <clears throat> with this, we can see the average of all of their studies, like kind of what happened, and like which one that it essentially favored. And then the bars, that's essentially the variance within that study. But the biggest thing that we need to look at is this diamond at the very bottom. So that's a summary of the like, uh, uh, like, uh, like weighted mean and everything. And 
just generally how to interpret these, if that diamond crosses that middle line, then we say it's statistically insignificant. Are you all good with that? That makes sense? And like that's, that's kind of like just coefficient variation or like whatever. But here, here, like low carb versus low fat. Like low carb did better in that respect across all of these studies. Now like this Yancey study uh, did really well. Like how do you think the data would have changed if we would have excluded that one? And maybe that Foster one too because the standard deviation is like a lot. Yeah, probably would have been closer to the middle. So like there's a couple of studies that are really dragging in a particular direction. Now like this uh, Dossinger study, like what if we threw that one out? Because that, that one and uh, that one's really pulling it that way, right? What's up, Ari? Yeah, yeah, it would go the other direction. So like out of these 11 studies, like I, you can really alter it by like what your inclusion criteria is and like what you actually pick to compare. So like just that one right there, I, I, I think that's kind of interesting. And that, that's pretty consistent whenever you've read like hundreds of studies on low carbohydrate diets that, yeah, they do reduce body weight by around two kilograms. Now in this next thing, uh, like uh, blood triglycerides, this one is another one that low carbohydrate diets seem to have a relatively profound effect on. And actually, strangely, a lot of low fat diets frequently increase uh, like blood triglycerides. So that didn't really come up in the paper, but I, I think it's interesting nonetheless. Uh, like this next one, uh, like um, total cholesterol, I'm sorry, like I kind of pasted this in in um, uh, somewhat of a rushed way. So total cholesterol, it did go this way a little bit. Now only a couple of the studies actually measured total cholesterol. Most of them do LDL, HDL, and things like that. But this one measured just total cholesterol in the blood. And it seemed like it favored low fat a little bit. But what did I just tell you? That diamond, if it crosses that like midline, that means it's statistically insignificant. And also with there being fewer studies in this, this one less comfortable about. Less comfortable about agreeing with. You all good with that? That makes sense? Okay. Uh, the next one, uh, this one right here, HDL cholesterol. This one seems like a relatively profound effect to where like, uh, now this, this to me is the biggest mistake in the paper. So, all right, right here, look up top. Low carbs on the left, low fats on the right. Right, we all see that? And then right here, what happens? Low fat is on the left, low carb is on the right. So they switch that, they switch that, which if you're not paying attention to it, you can miss it. Right? So, like, it's uh, for whatever reason, they uh, like messed up just a little bit in like putting together these, uh, uh, these graphs. But, you know, if, if you know what you're looking at, it's okay. So, HDL cholesterol, that favored uh, like um, a low carb diet probably the most. Uh, this next one, uh, change in LDL cholesterol. Um, this one favored uh, low fat diet the most, meaning that they had the least of an increase. Now, right here, that diamond. It's like right touching that line, right? Now it doesn't cross it, so it's still statistically significant. But th this one, HDL, quite a bit more statistically significant than this LDL one. Y'all good with that? So I feel more comfortable in saying if you do a low carbohydrate diet, your HDL cholesterol will go up. I feel fairly confident about that. But if you do a low uh, fat diet, I uh, like, I, or, I feel a little less certain about saying that your LDL cholesterol is going to go down. Does that make sense? Right? Ho hopefully that makes sense. Um, so LDL being bad cholesterol, all that type of stuff. Um, this one, change in blood pressure, systolic blood pressure. That one crosses the line, so we don't really need to think about it. Um, uh, this one, change in diastolic blood pressure, also crosses the line, but leans towards the low carbohydrate just like systolic did, but we don't need to think about it. Um, this one, uh, like the blood glucose, Really, they both did approximately the same in fasting blood glucose. So, uh, like this one right here, this Bream in 2003, like they had massive reductions in blood glucose, but you know, the rest of them were approximately the same with uh, like low fat diets, which this makes sense. Like most of us are around like 85 milligrams per deciliter, and there's not a whole lot you can do to really like alter that. Um, uh, what's up with this next one? Uh, uh, circulating insulin, that didn't really seem to change very much 
either. Now that uh, uh, Bazzano, that one went down a lot. And Dossinger, this one went down a lot. So that's, that's kind of interesting there. So the conclusions from it. And I'm going to read this whole thing to you because I think it's important. The present uh, meta-analysis that included dietary interventions on individuals with increased body mass index but regarded as otherwise, uh, otherwise as healthy, they found greater weight loss in subjects on a low-carbohydrate diet with subjects, uh, than with uh, subjects on a low-fat diet, more favorable changes in HDL, triglycerides, less favorable changes in LDL cholesterol levels. However, none of these studies examined effects of LDL diet uh, sorry, a low carbohydrate diet. I'm trying to talk fast. Um, a low carbohydrate diet on hard endpoints such as cardiovascular disease or mortality. So they didn't measure anyone dying. Now, granted, in none of these studies, anyone died. So that's kind of a good thing. So kind of irrelevant in some ways, and is therefore impossible to draw conclusions in this regard. Nevertheless, as eight as LDL cholesterol is highly atherogenic they raise a question about low carbohydrate diets being potentially bad. So atherogenic, essentially that means buildup of plaque within your arteries and like things like that. Like everyone good with this? Now this was in the British Medical Journal. One year earlier, this study was published, which like, like here, I, I'm just gonna read uh, the top and the first sentence of the conclusion. And uh, this was a pretty good study. So lack of an association or an inverse association between low density lipoprotein cholesterol, which is LDL or bad cholesterol, and mortality in the elderly, a systematic review. So the conclusion here, and like, I'm not gonna go into this paper too much because I like, right, right, time. Um, High LDLC, so bad cholesterol, is inversely associated with mortality in most people over 60. What does that mean? Can anyone tell me what that means? So inversely associated with mortality, so mortality means dying, right? Inversely. What's up, Sophia? Yeah. Yeah, if you're over 60, if you're over 60, which death inflicts most people over 60, right? So like death doesn't inflict many people under 60 in most cases, right? Right. So in the same journal, one year earlier, what they finished saying in their conclusion was actually, I'm not going to say it was proven that LDL has no association with death, but at least it's confusing, right? Are you all good with that, right? So it's uh, like, what's the take home here? Nothing. I just think it's interesting. Okay, cool. Awesome. So like, let's go ahead and move on to surveys and things. Um, so the survey that you have, like, uh, go and pull it out. There's going to be some that we're going to do with it um, more in a second. I, I think I can get all of this knocked out um, before we like get going. So we need to go back and reverse score some things. So a couple of these. Uh, reverse scoring means effectively given the opposite score. So if you put a 1 for it, you need to put a 7. If you put a 2 for it, you need to put a 6. If you put a 6, you need to put a 2. If you uh, like uh, a 3, you need to put a 5. A 4 stays a 4. So I need you to do this for a couple of these. Number 2, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 13. So go ahead and take your time doing that. Yes, yes, yeah. So yeah, a seven is a one, a six is a two, a five is a three, and a four is a four. Yes, yeah. Just numbers two, four, six, eight, not 10 because I don't know how to count by twos. Um, So I go and cross out the scores that you put on these and then write the other one. This is just so I don't have to reverse score whenever I'm putting it into an Excel sheet.
Like, how funny would it be, like, since I'm putting this on YouTube? What, like, what if I read an ad right now? It's like, you know, like that, what is it, Dollar Shaving Club. This is brought to you by this lecture at University of wisconsin Wildwater is brought to you by... Uh, do you want us to come and vote? No, 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 I'll do it. Okay, are we done reverse scoring? Okay, so go ahead and pass them on down to the end. I, uh, <clears throat> Ryan, pay attention, dude. It's all right. It's all right. Dude, this is on this is on YouTube language, man. Excellent. Love y'all. Love y'all again. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I have to put this as not for children. All right. That's uh yeah, children are not allowed to get a college education. So right. Which uh, I'm not even sure if this is legal that I'm doing all this for free. Um but whatever. I can free country. Um okay, so like going into this uh just a little bit. So what you did was a survey assessing personality. And effectively, I'm going to do somewhat of a personality association with like your GPA, if you put that, how many minutes of exercise that you do a week, or the very last question, if you're a good person or not. Because there's an idea that some of these like might be, the, these concepts might be related to each other. And overall, these are the three types, or like three essentially like personality metrics that I actually measured in you just now. So like if we look at these, extroversion like ever like I could just ask you hey are you extroverted right on a scale of 1 to 7 tell me how extroverted you are so I could do that or I could ask you a bunch of different questions that are aspects of extroversion and like add them all together right that that's effectively what's going on here and I'm going to tell you what that like like what those words are here momentarily but hopefully everyone sees that is talkative extroverted people are talkative right Right, is reserved. Reverse score that. So that's this. That, that that's one of the questions. Like, if we reverse score that, that's extroverted. Like, introverted people are reserved. Is full of energy, generates a lot of enthusiasm, is outgoing, sociable. All these things. These are all extroverted behaviors, right? Agreeableness tends to find uh, fault in others, and uh, like that's. If uh, like if you're super critical of people, like if you find fault in other people, you're not a very agreeable, nice person more or less, right? Like, like we all can think about that. Like, I'm, I'm not gonna talk about any more of these. You know what numbers you put for all these. Um, conscientiousness does a thorough job. Oh man, spelled that wrong. All right, cool, good. Um, did I spell it wrong on y'all's thing too? Yeah. yeah, I did? Good, good. Yeah, this is an English class. Um, okay, so here's the thing. Here's the thing that I want you to know about all this. And like, you have the rest of this um, on Canvas. So a single question is termed an item. And then whenever we put a bunch of items together to see how they correlate, it is then called a construct. So numerous items make up a construct. So I don't know, like, like be aware of that. So like here the item is talkative, that's just an item. Extroversion is the construct. So like uh, effectively what a construct is, it's like a variable that isn't exactly real. I have to measure it by a bunch of other like proxy or like different measures. Hope, uh, hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. So whenever I ask a bunch of different questions, we then do something called a factor analysis, which effectively looks at how well these different items correlate together. So the idea is that if you put a, I don't know, say a uh, five or a six in is talkative, maybe you'll put like a five or a six and generates a lot of enthusiasm. Meaning that like I'm asking fairly similar things, but it's, it, it, like they should be related in some way, right? So, so if someone put seven in is talkative and they put a seven in is reserved, who like, you're not answering these questions well, like you don't know what these words mean, right? So that would be one way how we could figure out that. Is everyone good with this, right? Okay. Um, 
so factor analysis, that's what that's called. Um, I'm staying in tonight, but I didn't even look at that. Um, uh, so like we can do a lot with these surveys, uh, like, but they have a lot of problems and there's just like different problems that like I'm going to, you know, be talking about, right? Generally, whenever we put in these surveys together, like, so for all of you, there's different survey batteries that you can find through other research. And if someone else has already done all the hard work of like doing validation and factor analyses, just read their method section and take what they used and cite them. That's uh, uh, like, it's plagiarism and like a, a lot of things of what people do, but as long as you cite them in science, it's all good, right? Uh, but whenever we're doing this, you have to think about what you actually want to measure. So there's an idea that there might be a relationship between conscientiousness or extroversion and how many minutes you exercise per week. So I'm going to do some statistics on that and I'm going to bring that to you next class. Um, so think about what you actually want to measure. So like I kind of want to see how outgoing some of you are and like if that's related to your exercise. Uh, like next thing, you need to ask it in many ways. That's the many items within like a particular uh, construct. And here, general ideas for constructing these surveys. Now, this isn't like a hard and fast like rule, but typically you don't want to use strong words or strong language. Words like always and never shouldn't really be within most surveys unless you're actually trying to get at that. Um, so uh, there's that. Next thing. Other recommendations, and these are some issues with uh, like surveys, and these will be questions on like exams and things. So like, uh, be ready for this. You can't ask lead-in questions. So, how dumb is blank uh, like politician regarding foreign policy? So a lead-in question that's like leading someone to answer in a particular way. Like I could ask, how great is exercising outdoors? Tell me how much you agree with that on a scale of one to seven, right? So that would be leading you to say, oh yeah, like I guess it is great, you know, to like uh, exercise outdoors or whatever with uh, politicians. Um, next thing, a loaded question. This is forcing someone to answer in a particular way. Like this one, th this question, th this is one of the stupidest examples I could come up with, but I think it's funny nonetheless. Uh, like if I ask in a survey, like kind of a more open-ended survey, where do you like to party? That loaded question, meaning I'm presuming that you even like to party at all. You know, where do you like to exercise? At the gym, at home, whatever. I'm presuming that you like to exercise or th that you even do it. Does everyone understand like the difference between a leading and a loaded question? Right? One is leading someone to answer a particular way. The other one is essentially assuming things. Um, another one, double-barreled questions. This is asking two things at once. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna. I, I'm not gonna read that at you. It, like most double-barreled questions are easily fixed by just making it two different items. Another thing, uh, survey fatigue. Now, on the survey that I gave y'all, I effectively asked approximately 20 questions. Approximately 20 questions, you know, male, female, like if you're, uh, like, uh, uh, how much you exercise, what your GPA is, and then, like, 16, like, like analyses, questions about things. Did any of you feel tired after taking that survey? No, like, probably not. What if you had to answer 200 questions about your personality, right? By question 112, <coughs> do you think you'd still be giving me, like, good information, right? Probably not. So survey fatigue. That's essentially like try to uh, consolidate a particular survey so you're not asking too many questions because people don't like at answering uh, so many questions. Next thing, types of bias. Here's a couple. Um, <clears throat> I think that's all of them. Uh, demand characteristics, social desirability, extreme and neutral responses, acquiescence and dissidence. So we're going to talk about all of those like really quick. Um, so here's one. Uh, like demand bias or demand characteristics bias. So uh, a lot of times in particular studies with exercise or diet, which I think a lot of us are interested in, um, if you ask someone like in a survey about how much they exercise or how many vegetables they eat or something like that, just them like answering those questions and they're like, oh dang, like I shouldn't have put a two in the amount of vegetables I eat per week. And then they change their behavior to start eating more vegetables 
or to start exercising more. So that's essentially a demand characteristic, right? That like the study is having a particular effect on the person to change their life. That it, it's just by putting paper in front of them. This next one, social desirability bias, and uh, like three or four. I like I meant to put uh, five or a six. So like social desirability. This one is like a huge problem. Uh, types of response bias, that is the tendency of survey respondents to answer a question in a manner that will be viewed favorably by others. So over-reporting good behavior, under-reporting bad behavior. So this is why I asked you the, uh, this question. Are you a good person? How many of you put a five or a six for it? Right, most of us, right? So, so the reason that we put that, no one wants to put a seven. I'm not a saint. I'm not Jesus, right? Right? Like, you don't want to put below average, right? Because, like, well, like, I'm at least above average on this. But in reality, most of us are probably fours or right in the middle. Because, like, I don't know, I've done some bad stuff this weekend, right? So it's, uh, and this next weekend, I'm going to do more evil things. Um, it's, uh, I feed humans to my dogs. So, um, uh, but social desirability bias. Hey, this is on YouTube. I don't care, man. Cool. Rock on. Okay. Uh, here, j just a couple more things and we're almost done. So extreme and neutral responses. So a lot of people might put ones or sevens for everything. So like extremes on either side. So whenever I put this uh, together, I, I, I neglected to change the, the fives to like sevens. So like a lot of times I do one to five surveys. So that's, that's why. Uh, uh, or neutral responses. If people put all fours, that's a neutral response. And how we get around this is reverse scoring. So we ask the opposite of what we're actually trying to answer, to, to ask, and that essentially breaks it up to where people aren't like just always doing extreme or m uh, middle responses. Um, uh, like, so how to deal with this phrasing, number of uh, response options might have some of an impact on this. I'm not going to test too heavily about that. Um, acquiescence or dissent bias? Ah, oh, man, just a couple more seconds. So acquiescence bias is a form of response bias where participants respond in agreement with anything that you're asking. Like, it's also called yay saying bias. Um, dissent bias is essentially someone just being super disagreeable, also called naysaying bias. So if you ask a question on a survey, they have a tendency to just disagree with everything, even though like some of the things they're disagreeing with are inconsistent. And uh, most of that's handled by reverse scoring. And internal consistency, this last thing, I'm going to do what's called a Cronbach Alpha. And here's the only thing I want you to know about Cronbach Alpha is if you're ever reading survey research, the Cronbach alpha needs to be above a 0.8. Now we can calculate a Cronbach alpha through a couple of different things. So here's the equation for it. It looks super busy. It's not that busy. It's so like, like I actually cal can calculate it by hand. Um, uh, so, huh? No, it, it really doesn't. So all you need to know is the number of items on the survey. So like five per personality trait and the amount of variance within like each personality trait. So essentially the standard deviation. So if I do all of that, I put that into that equation, I get a Cronbach alpha. So uh, that's it. Read the astrology science stuff, and I'll see you on Wednesday.